let's review all the tests as quick as we can, reminding you of some things. Remember with the divergence test, you always think about using that first, make that a habit. Even if it's completely obvious that you could use some other test right away, just think about it at least. Make a habit of just thinking about it. And sometimes you might encounter an example that looks really hard. Oh, say something like this, summation, n goes from one to infinity. I've been using k, but certainly we can use n and the book uses n in their exercises often. Say three n squared plus four n all divided by 1,000 1, n squared plus five n plus two. Yikes, that looks really hard. Does it converge or diverge? And you look at that and say, I have no idea. And I'm saying, yes, you do. But you're saying, no, Dr. Kinney, I don't. I don't know. Well, here's how to think about it. Think about the divergence test, excuse me, <clears throat> right away. That's your term, your general term, a n in this case. <coughs> It's the part after the therefore that's the most useful way to think about the divergence test. It says if the terms do not converge to zero, then the series diverges. The A's are the terms without the summation sign. That's the terms. Those are the numbers that are being added for the series. The A's converge, but they don't converge to zero. It's a rational function. Degree of the top and the bottom is the same. They're both second degree. We know that as n goes to infinity here, this would approach the ratio of the coefficients of the highest powers of n. This approaches three over a thousand, point zero zero three, as n goes to infinity. But that's not that's close to zero. But it's not equal to zero. It wouldn't matter how big this coefficient was. I could make it 10 to the million power times n squared. The fraction a n would still not approach zero. And that's good enough by the divergence test to say the series diverges. Therefore, the series, including the summation sign, I'm purposely circling it with the summation sign, the series diverges. The terms converge, but they don't converge to zero. Enough to say the series diverges. Super important to understand those subtle distinctions. And the way to do it is to think about it pretty much every day between now and the exam. Okay, you can take breaks here and there. But if you want it to stick in your mind, you need to rethink about these things both by doing reading, by working on homework and thinking about them, and having your mind turned on when you're in class. Don't zone out. I know it's hard. It's hard to pay attention. I've been there. Even now, I do find it challenging to pay attention to when, when people are talking about math, even though I like math, even though I get math pretty well. It's a challenge to pay attention. Got to be in the math zone, have your mind turned on. Listen very carefully to every single thing that I say and, and think about it as we go. The test can be written in either form, which is again, a little exercise in logic, which I want to remind you of again. This clause here, this phrase, the series converges, you could give a shorthand, call it P. This clause, the sequence of terms converges to zero, you could give a shorthand, you could call it Q. If you use that shorthand, and that is all it is, is just shorthand, you could write the theorem as if P then Q, and we are saying it is a theorem, and so therefore that we're saying it is a true theory, true statement, a true implication, meaning if you know the series converges, the terms are going to have to go to zero. Another way to write this, as Michael reminded me, 
last time is P implies Q is another word, symbolic way to write this. P implies Q, sometimes just a single arrow. I like putting double arrows there. P implies Q. That's the first sentence. The second sentence is called its contrapositive. Contrapositive. Where you switch around the location of the P and Q and you negate them. If not Q, then not P. I switched around the P and the Q and I put the word not in front of it. Another symbolic way to do that uh, is like this, not Q implies not P, this little funny looking thing in front of the, uh, uh, in front of the P and the Q means not. Sometimes people do that symbol instead. It's a pure symbolic logic way of saying not Q implies not P. That's a P there. The contrapositive means the exact same thing as the original statement. The second sentence is the contrapositive of the first. This phrase, this clause is not Q. If Q is the phrase, the sequence of terms converges to zero, then its negation is the sequence of terms does not converge to zero, which could occur in different ways. It, they could converge to something non-zero or they could diverge like the sequence that bounces back and forth between one and negative one, for example, that diverges. It doesn't settle down towards a single number. The series in the video I shared from number file, that one plus two plus three plus four, et cetera, equals negative one twelfth. Technically, they're lying to you, <laughs> but they're lying in a way that still has application. Okay. According to how we are defining series to converge by saying the sequence of partial sums converges, their video is junk. Their tricks that they showed you, if you watch the video, and if you haven't, you should, the tricks they show you are meaningless. But it turns out that those meaningless operations that they do have meaning in another context if they redefine things in different ways. It's based on some complex number theory, advanced complex number theory called analytic continuation, which is super high level advanced stuff. They're trying to mess with your mind by showing you simple ways to think about it that are non-rigorous and non-valid in fact. From a different perspective, there's what they say makes sense and even has applications, but that's not what we're doing. So even though it's a confusing video because of that, just say, okay, we're, that's not what we're doing in our calculus class. Right? We are trying to do rigorous math right now. Of all the times in the semester where we're trying to do rigorous math, it's right now. This part of the clause is not Q. Or not P, excuse me. Not P. That little symbol there means not. Contrapositive and, and the original statement mean the exact same thing. If one's true, the other's true. If one's false, the other's false. In this case, they're both true. The converse statement, however, is not equivalent to the original. The converse is where you switch the P and the Q around, but do not negate them. If Q, then P or Q implies P. The converse is not a equivalent to the original statement. It does not mean the same thing. If the original statement is true, the converse may be true or it may not be true. It depends on the situation. If it is true, it's another theorem. It's really a different theorem. So sometimes they're written with the phrase, if and only if in the same theorem. It really is two different theorems though, if it is true. But in this case, the converse is false. This is important to know. The converse of the divergence test is false. If the AK is go to zero, 
this series converges is a false statement. We know examples where that doesn't work. Harmonic series, or in fact, any P series where P is less than or equal to one and bigger than zero. The terms go to zero, but the series diverges. Harmonic series diverges. Quickly, just think about these ideas again in a very uh, super simple context. I think I shared this with you on Monday. Here's a simple implication. If X is five, then X squared equals 25. Did I share that example with you on Monday? I forgot. Okay, I did it with the first section. That was one that I did with the first section, but I didn't with you. There's a simple implication. That's definitely true, right? If X is five, X squared is 25. We know five squared is 25, that's true. If I wrote 26, it would be false. It's contrapositive is if X is not, if X squared is not 25, then X is not five. That's also true because it means the same thing as the first. How would you prove the second from the first? Okay, assume X squared is not 25. Why is X not five? Well, if X were five, then X squared would be 25, which it's not done. Say that again. It's a very quick argument, but it's confusing because it feels like it's circular. Assume X squared is not 25. Why is the X not five? If X were five, then X squared would be 25, but it's not. Contradiction. I was assuming it was not 25. Here's the converse though. The converse is if X squared is 25, then X is five. Is that a true or false statement? And by true, I, I mean always true, not just sometimes true. See people shake, shaking their head, that's correct. It, it's, it's a false statement. If X squared is 25, X is not necessarily five. It could be negative five. You could say, well, it could be five. Yes, but the entire statement as an implication is false because it could be negative five. If I added a clause in here, if I said X squared equals 25 and X is positive, then X is five, then it would become a true statement. But I did not say that. I did not say X is positive. So this is a false statement. The converse here is false, whereas the original statement is true. An example where both the original statement and the converse are true, I'd have to do a simpler algebraic equation, is if x is 2, then, x, uh, then 3x is 6. That would be an example where the original statement is true and the converse is true. If, that, if 3x is 6, then x is 2. Those are both true, even though they're not equivalent. They're two different mini theorems, you might say. Oh, take a breath. I next want to very quickly review the other tests leading up to the ratio tests for which we should do more examples. So I don't want to do detailed examples here. Let me, but let's just review these other tests and mention some things that could show up on the exam perhaps. Integral test, let f of x be a continuous function that is decreasing in positive on this interval. Again, I pick the interval from one to infinity Really, any interval from some number to infinity would be fine. Most of the examples we typically do go from one to infinity, like for the P series. And suppose AK equals F of K. So the graph of F of X as a graph of a continuous function is like this, and it's decreasing and positive. Is the x-axis a horizontal asymptote or not? That's not part of the first sentence. It would have to be a horizontal asymptote in the case where this integral converges. 
So most typically you do imagine it to be an horizontal asymptote. That's what most typically happens, at least for part A. Even for part B, that typically happens because that's sort of, the, again, the more interesting situations where you're where the AKs are still going to zero, but you're not sure does the series converge or diverge. If that integral converges, then the series also converges. That's part A. If this improper integral diverges, then the series diverges. You might wonder, does the implication go the other way? Are the converses of these statements true? I'll let you think about that if you are interested. I won't say. Corollary. Corollary means it follows from the theorem. P series converge if and only if P is greater than one, which also means it diverges if and only if P is less than or equal to one. And these are if and only ifs. They are two-way implications. There's really two theorems here in this line. If this series converges, then P is bigger than one. And if P is bigger than one, then the series converges. Mostly we use the other direction. If P is bigger than one, then the series converges. By essentially taking the contrapositive of both of those implications, we get this if and only if. It diverges if and only if P is less than or equal to one. Diverging is the negation of converging. P being less than or equal to one is the negation of P being bigger than one. When P is one, it's called the harmonic series. We know that diverges. I have often put this kind of application on exam two. Show a series like this converges or diverges based on doing an improper interval. Okay, that's a pretty common thing for me to put on exam two. <clears throat> Maybe make it a little more, more, more complicated than a P series, but still something that you should be able to do. For example, as a quick example, like this one. That would be an example you should be able, be able to apply the integral test to. So you integrate one over x squared plus one, the arc tangent becomes involved. I'll let you think about it. Comparison test. We got a sequence of, or series of non, non-negative terms, the AKs or the BKs, depending on whether you're looking at part A or part B. And you're wanting to know, does it converge or diverge? You, you really have to have a guess about convergence or divergence to have a chance of using this. And that's why the authors of the textbook emphasize the intuitive idea of guessing the answer ahead of time based on the behavior of the terms. What's the capital K? It's just a positive integer. It could be one, it could be two, it could be three, it could be four, it could be a million, it could be a billion. In most applications, capital K is one, but it could be any integer for which these inequalities are true as long as little k is large enough, greater than or equal to capital K. This just gives you a little bit more flexibility to say capital K can be anything bigger than one. I also could have given myself more flexibility in the integral test, or I didn't. Two things to prove that need proved or could be used, a part A and a part B. Think about them intuitively, and it should make sense even though we're not proving it. If the series whose terms are the BKs, and I keep phrasing it that way, you should pay attention to my phrasing. If the series whose terms are the BKs converges, Notice the BKs are bigger than the AKs. The series whose terms are bigger converges than the series whose terms are smaller also must converge. And when I say they're smaller, they're also not negative, so I don't have to worry about adding large negative numbers or something. On the other hand, if the series whose terms are smaller diverges, then the series whose terms are bigger will also diverge. And actually B here is the, what would be contrapositive or converse of A. Statement B, 
Go ahead, Michael. Contrapositive. Statement B is the contrapositive statement A, equivalent to it. In other words, if you prove statement A, you've proved statement B. They're not really two separate theorems. So it's easier to think of them in two different ways. Why? Because if this clause is P and this clause is Q, then this one would be not Q and this one would be not P. I do sometimes put comparison test problems on exams. I did on the last exam for the comparison test for improper integrals, in fact. If I do, it would be one like I showed you on Monday where it's relatively easy because you can make very hard examples too. But the point is not to test you on really hard examples. That's more for an upper level class called real analysis to test you on harder examples. The point is just to get the basic idea. Those are the kind of boring proofs, right? I have to I really have to say all these things. Yes, you do. In the order that I showed you on Monday. Limit comparison test is typically a little easier to imply, even though it involves a limit, because you don't have to worry about getting the inequalities right. You just have to guess what the series behaves like. You have to guess correctly. And then compute this limit and see if it's a positive number or not. And if it is, then these both either converge or both diverge. They converge together or they diverge together. They behave similar ways. Absolute convergence implies convergence. The example where we applied this last time was this series. That's a series, some of whose terms are negative. Before this test, well, except for the divergence test and ge some geometric series, we didn't have any way to deal with series whose terms are negative. We did, technically, the divergence test can still apply sometimes. Technically, geometric series can have, as you've seen in homework problems, sometimes have negative terms. But the other tests, integral test, Comparison test, limit comparison test, all involve series whose terms are either positive or at least non-negative with the comparison test. We this is not geometric. There's no common ratio here. Take any term and divide by the previous term. You do not get a constant. It is not the same for every single one of those divisions. So if we're going to have a chance of proving this converges, we'd have to try this test. The divergence test does not apply because these terms do go to zero. Though they alternate in sign, that's okay. It still goes, they still go to zero. However, the series whose terms are the absolute values of these things, so you get rid of that negative one of the k plus one and just make it a one, does converge because it's a p-series with p equal to two, which is bigger than one. So this test would imply that since that one converges, then this one, the original one does converge as well. Is the converse of this true? If a series diverges, or a converse I'm talking, if such a series like this converges, does that imply this kind of series converges? No. We'll look at an example right now related to a new fact called the alternating series test. I'll come back to the ratio test. Alternating series test. We will come back to the ratio test and do a new example there. Alternating series test. If you got an alternating series that looks like this, where all these Bs are positive, the BKs 
form a decreasing sequence of positive real numbers whose limit is zero. And you are alternating in sign here, B1 minus B2 plus B3 minus B4 plus B5 minus B6, et cetera. So I'm alternatingly adding a positive number or subtracting a positive number. This test says that such a series converges. The book used AK, used series of negative one to the K minus one times BK, which you would write out A1 minus A2 plus A3 minus A4 plus A5 minus A6 plus dot, dot, dot. I purposely wanted to use a different letter because it's confusing to use AKs because we've always been writing our original series with AKs, with those AKs being the terms. If you put an AK there, the AKs are no longer the terms. It would be negative one to the K minus one times AK that would be the terms. To make these match, AK must be negative one to the K minus one times BK to make those two symbols match. So I preferred using BK here. What's an example where you can use this test for a series that alternates and for which maybe you cannot use this one. The most famous example is called the alternating harmonic series. Summation k goes from one to infinity of negative one to the k minus one over k. <clears throat> By the way, the use of the uh, exponent k minus one is an, kind of an arbitrary choice. It could have been k plus one, or it could even be k plus any odd number, or k minus any odd number. k plus or minus any odd number is going to give us a positive one when k is odd and an, a negative one when k is even, giving us the same result here in the end. The alternating harmonic series looks like this. <clears throat> looks like the harmonic series except the signs are alternating plus minus plus minus plus minus plus minus etc according to this test the alternating series test the bk's are one over k they form a decreasing sequence of positive no real numbers whose limit is zero decreasing sequence not series, sequence of positive real numbers whose limit is zero. Therefore, by the alternating series test, if we believe it, the alternating harmonic series converges. Therefore, the alternating harmonic series converges. However, there's no way to prove that using the previous test right here. Because if I tried using this test, the series whose terms are the absolute values of the alternating harmonic series is the harmonic series, the ordinary one, which we know diverges. So we can't use this test. This series converges in spite of the fact that the harmonic series diverges if we believe the alternating series test. And I'm telling you, yes, believe it, it is a theorem. If you draw a little picture of the partial sums, it does make some intuitive sense that this should converge. And we could even estimate its sum. Here's zero, here's one. The first partial sum is just one, that's S sub one. The second partial sum is one minus a half, which is a half. That's S sub two, 0.5. The third partial sum is one minus a half plus a third, 
0.5 plus 0.3 repeating is 0.8333333 repeating. Say right about here, that's S3. The fourth partial sum is one minus a half, 0.5, plus 0.3 repeating is 0.8333 repeating. Minus 0.25 is what, 0.5583 repeating, I think. Somewhere right around here is S4. S5, you add on 0.2 to that and bring you right around here. S6 might be right around there. These numbers, these partial sums are bouncing back and forth, bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller, but they keep getting closer and closer together. And the fact that the BKs go to zero means they do have a limit. S, the actual sum of the series is somewhere in there, say. It's a limit of the partial sums. It does exist, it turns out, though that takes proof. What does it equal? From the picture, it looks like it might be around 0.7. Is that right? It's actually pretty close. It is pretty close to 0.7. I happen to know from past experience what it converges to. Was that my math not going to work? OK, yep, that's the right one. I happen to know what it converges to, the alternating harmonic series. I've learned about it in the past. Mathematica, what does it converge to? Here's the answer. I'll tell you without entering it yet. Natural log of two. Remember, LOG is natural log. What? More surprises. Who would have expected natural log of two? Yeah, the integral of one over X is natural log of X. So maybe that's related, but this is alternating. It's not one over K, which is the harmonic series, which diverges. So you, maybe it's related to that. It's a good guess. Actually, we will see, I think even next week, why that works. Excitement to come. That's the exciting part of the subject is when you do that kind of thing. Like, why did that work? <laughs>